Has it come to this? Oh, 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 oh. Original podcast material, you're listening to Tom and Ollie. Hello, Tom. Hello, Wally. What's going on? Uh, what's going on? Uh, I saw Simon Cowell the other day, actually, in Hyde Park. <laughs> he was looking very much like the Ice Age baby. I don't know if you've seen the meme. Yeah. I'm making my own obscure references now. Yeah, his head's um, gone all wrong, hasn't it? Yeah, I think he did something to his eyelids. Um, he just looks very wide-eyed now. Like he's constantly yeah, and his teeth are just surprised. gigantic. This is just veneers. A lot of people have veneers, I think. Um, yeah. Like celebrities. They're sort of perfect pearly whites. But yeah, I mean, he must be getting on a bit, so he's clearly fighting the ravages of age. Desperately, yeah. See, that's not a... I think we discussed this before on the podcast, haven't we? I, I don't like to think I'd be the, the kind of person that would fight age to the bitter end, you know, you just yeah. go embrace it. I think you do more damage so sort of entering the uncanny valley of people with unblemished foreheads and, you know, wide eyes, perfect smiles, too perfect. So what was Simon Cowell doing in Hyde Park? He was just with his mate, I think, walking, walking yeah. down um, past Kensington Palace. Was he enjoying the snow? I guess, yeah. I didn't stop to talk to him, to be honest. Um, Having a little snowball fight with David Walliams. <laughs> I d- I'm not sure who his mate was, to be honest. I can't, yeah. couldn't say. But um, yeah, I was in a bit of a hurry, so I didn't stop and chat. <laughs> uh, this is a true story, though. Yeah, um, that's, I'm not that's making an impressive up. spot, yeah. <laughs> Simon Cowell is very, very famous. Like... Uh... I don't know. Like the most famous person I've ever seen is probably uh, a comedy writer in Birmingham New Street Station, <laughs> and not even like a particularly famous comedy writer. Who was it? Oh, would I? Would I, know no, I don't think you'd know who he is, and I don't want to like out him. I suppose <laughs> he's very distinct. He's a very, got a very distinctive figure. Like yeah. he, he would be unmistakable. Nobody would want to be outed as being in Birmingham. That's uh, <laughs> the greatest shame you can have, I think. Um, so that's my second X Factor um, spot, if I can say spot. Because uh, obviously I went to secondary school with Harry Styles as well. So mm-hmm. that's my first cross on the list. So I got to. Got to work hard to complete that list. How about you? What have you been up to? Oh, I've been doing all sorts of crazy crap. Um, trying to nail down Japanese verbs, you know, hook them into place, making them stay there. Um, I've been rewriting my CV. I've sort of settled on a 64-sized font phrase, will word good for food. I think that will <laughs> really uh, impress employers. And yeah, sort of. Well, I've decided that I need to finish my first draft of my novel uh, before my birthday. And if I don't, I would volunteer to perform some sort of forfeit. So have a think about what sort of forfeit I could perform and tell me at the end of the show. That's called a hook, ladies and gentlemen, in broadcasting. I've got one in mind because I also forfeited something last year, which I promised our mutual... Bulgarian friend, um, and I mean the, the fourth of me is to just do it at all. But um, yeah, I'll let you know at the end. It's mm. a good one. Excellent. So <laughs> we've both got to do things we don't want to do potentially. Yes, I mean that's just called character growth. <laughs> that's just called life. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to be optimism. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm only pessimistic for pay. Not that I'm getting paid for this, so maybe I'm just pessimistic. <laughs> but uh, I had um, a good time looking for questions this week. Um, I know last episode we branched out a bit looking at yeah. um, newspaper agony anti articles, but uh, maybe it's the COVID era, but there's a lot of, like we said it before, there's a lot of miserable. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, a lot of miserable questions out there, which fair enough. But I think being a comedy podcast, we want to try and find some yeah, good humor. We're trying ones. to keep it as lighthearted as we can. Yeah. So we we've done away with the restriction of looking uh, for 
zero points or zero comments on questions when it comes to Reddit advice, anyway. And Yahoo Answers, I guess, but that's just a that's a dump of a <laughs> spot for questions. So, yeah, it's been it's been a good time this week finding questions. I got some good ones lined up. Do you want to start us off then? Yeah, I'm just having a look, see what I've got. Still nowhere near as organised as yourself with your, my printouts. No, I don't actually have printouts today because I got a new phone, so <laughs> I've up, <laughs> I've upgraded to be just screenshotting on the phone, or is that downgrading? I don't know. Okay, so I've got one here, which is uh, this is from the Daily Star actually, their agony aunt quality That's newspaper. Cool. Yeah, definitely. But uh, they seem to... <laughs> if, if you enjoy beer, tits and sport. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to veer more to the comedic side with their uh, choice of questions. Anyway, so here it goes. I only fancy bad boys. I'm breaking up with third fiancé because he's too nice. I have to leave him because he's too nice for me. There is no danger, excitement or edge whatsoever in our relationship. Why do I only fancy bad boys? Why do decent, regular blokes leave me cold? I'm in the process of breaking up with my third fiancé. He's heartbroken that I'm leaving. He, he and his lovely mother were organising a big wedding for us. We were due to live in a beautiful cottage and benefit from an inheritance from his granny. Sounds a bit like a peep show. <laughs> I have to yeah. leave because he's too nice for me. I don't like to use the word dull, but there is no danger, excitement or edge in our relationship. When we make love, it is past lovers and future conquests that I'm always fantasizing about. He'd be horrified if he actually knew what was whirling around my dirty mind at that point of orgasm. At the point of orgasm, sorry. I may look sleek and co coordinated on the outside. My boss calls me her little star, but my mind is a sewer and my sexual appetite very niche. I like men who couldn't give a damn. Men who wear what they like and live by their own rules. I'm always drawn to the snarling, grubby misfit in the corner. It's the guy who fascinates and intrigues me and turns me on. If my boss ever saw a lineup of my most treasured past lovers, she would flip out. Now I'm itching again for fresh meat. I'm hungry for screaming rows, anger and red-hot passion. Just so I can feel truly alive. My best friend knows me inside out. She's as vanilla as I am kinky. We love each other like sisters, but I know that I exasperate her. She worries about me being lonely and washed up in the future. So this can't be too unusual, I don't think. Bad boys are a bit of a cliche. Mm. But uh, seems... Speaking of the X Factor, I'm reminded of Alexandra Burke's Bad Boys song. They were all always catching her eye. Uwe, uwa. Ooh, your um, X Factor knowledge is better than mine. I <laughs> never really kept up with it. <laughs> but uh, wh what do you think about that? Um, so she's turned down Nana's cottage. Yeah. And she wants to, you know, live free, die hard. I can respect that, obviously. <laughs> uh, with my own sort of uh, starving artist future ahead of me. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the way to go. If you're not in love with a guy, don't just settle for Nana's cottage and, you know, an easy... Sunday Times existence, like if that you know you you literally only get to live once, mm -hmm. like that's not just a phrase, <laughs> it's true. Mm. So you sort of need to maximize it and live the experiences that you want to live, and even if that means you know you do it penniless and living in a shack, then you're probably going to be happier than you know sitting on a big pile of money that you're just never going to spend on anything meaningful and living in Nana's cottage with, you know, a family that you hate and resent. So, you know, even if people around you sort of consider you, you know, crazy, crazy Auntie Mary or whatever, like, you got to yeah. go for it if that is who you are. So, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, you've got to follow your heart, uh, as I've surely said before. Yeah, no, you, you hit the nail on the head there, I think. You, you are naturally going to resent those people if you kind of force yourself into that shape right it's just it's very much what society says is the right way to live and you know you you get married you have your nice little house maybe you have some mm. kids as well and there um, is a reason for that because obviously you know stability is good and mm -hmm. you know 
<laughs> yeah, you, know, you can purchase lots of nice things, but it's when those when those purchasing just becomes for the sake of it rather than because it's actually what you want. Yeah, that's when it uh, can delve into. Well, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing something a bit crazier, a bit riskier, but ultimately more fulfilling? Yeah, um, I can I can kind of appreciate that as well because I don't know with my I feel like I'm a bit pooped out with bad girls if i can say that um, <laughs> i don't know if that's even a term but yeah well i think with, especially with relationships it goes in cycles like you sort of you know you're with a good girl for a while and you get bored and so then you you know you go to your string of bad girls and then they exhaust you and you feel grubby and so you go back to a good girl and then, i don't yeah. know it's just sort of where the dice dice lands basically is what you end up with yeah no i uh I think that's kind of right you you're always kind of well grass is always green on the other side isn't it you're always yeah. kind of <laughs> the next thing a bit it takes discipline to actually settle down with somebody and i don't know maybe you can find like the ideal person who maybe um wants the same things as you and you can kind of i don't know you move in the same cycle together you know be each other's bad boy or bad girl from time yeah. to time it's like that um, game catherine uh oh the playstation game yeah, the anime one where you pick between the 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 normal dowdy Catherine or the insane uh, manic pixie Catherine. I think I watched you play it. it looked uh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, I really like it. I'll have to give it a go sometime. But yeah, I mean, it's it it's kind of a moot point which Catherine you pick as long as you don't die. Like, <laughs> like the the main goal is to survive the night and not fall into the gaping chasm of the monster chasing you. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember the well, second the bit goal I saw, is picking which Catherine you want. The only bit I saw of you playing was the thing of you trying to climb a tower in your dreams or something. Yeah. That's a big part of it. But I'm, I'm trying to spin that into a real life uh, <laughs> ah. uh, advice. Is like, yeah, do, do what will allow you to survive, basically. Don't worry about what other people will consider your decisions ultimately they're your decisions and if you're happy with them then you can't be you know if if you're okay with where you end up then you can't possibly hate how you got there yeah it does sound a bit concerning when she talks about you know having big arguments and stuff but if you're the kind of person that craves that then fair enough if you're happy uh with the outcome of that fair enough as long as you like you say as long as you survive it's fine, and you're, yeah, look out for yourself, number one, I think it's okay to not want the the usual thing or what other people project onto mm. you. Nana's Cottage is always tempting. But... Yeah, but even saying that, Nana's Cottage just sounds boring in my head. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, it's I just a nice place far. to sort yeah. of while away your existence and mm. f- fade into putrid grey nothingness. <laughs> But maybe that's not the worst thing if you know you live to a ripe old age. I don't know. It's all about the individual, I suppose, and the journey. Yeah, and I don't know. We still got a ways to go. I think maybe once you hit a certain age, you just stop caring. You're just like, yeah, it's just chill. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I don't know. Go for it. I say, it it sucks for the third fiance. Um, yeah. But they'll but, get over it as well, presumably. Yeah, but it could also be a lesson to recognise that maybe it's not something for you, and uh, maybe these guys who fall in love with you... Um, maybe they're doing it for the wrong reasons as well. Maybe, but I was thinking more in terms of maybe they just maybe there's a lesson to take away from not leading them on, you know? Um, why is it that you... Because I feel like three fiancés is quite a lot, you know, maybe, maybe, well, there's definitely a pattern there, so maybe something's going wrong there in terms of rushing into things or, I was had had to say without further context, but yeah, maybe stick to the bad boys. No one, <laughs> it's nobody's business. Go right on the back of a motorbike. All right, I'll hit you with my first problem. Please do. I created a young adult group online to help people expand their social circle. 
What activities can we do? Until it is safer to meet in person as per COVID, we are only doing things virtually. I plan on hosting games, crafts, and streaming movies. What else can I do? So I thought this would be a, a nice, fun one to kick us off, and obviously we're coming up to the one-year anniversary of uh, COVID world, so I thought yep. we would be able to discuss uh, what sort of online activities, group activities, uh, have been the most popular, and you know what are the best ways to make friends over the internet in these mad times. Uh, you can start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> nah, just kidding. We don't want the competition. Um, that's a tough one because I feel like everything I've personally done during lockdown to keep myself entertained has generally been trying to remove myself from the internet. Um, yeah. So this this is in the context of an online group, so it, it has to be kind of sociable in that respect, of being always online, yeah. I guess. Well, obviously, the sort of number one activity that has emerged is Among Us. Oh, yeah. I have been playing that a bit uh, with some of my work colleagues. Yeah. It's all right. I get too angry at it, though. Honestly, I can, <laughs> I can play it like once or twice every couple of months, and um, you know, I, just, I rage quit and don't come back to it wow. for a while. It's infuriating because, I mean, politics is uh, absolutely not my cup of tea um i think just i can't if if people just don't fit into my sort of argument then i just flip out um, <laughs> well it also sucks being outed as a imposter very early on but also if people don't if you're so certain someone else is the imposter and people just don't believe you then it's just uh, you mad bro yeah I don't know, I've quite I enjoyed maybe I haven't played it enough to have gotten that in like jaded with it, but I've quite enjoyed it when I've played it. <laughs> have you played it? Quite yeah. Um and yeah, it's certainly not the usual thing I would play, um, being very much a, a solo gamer. Mm. Um and you know, getting massively into my like train set uh out of the park baseball games. Mm -hmm. Um and she's like fiddling with tiny little things to make me feel like I'm some sort of god in this infinite vastness of the universe. <laughs> There's at least a little corner where I can be god. Um, but yeah, I have I have enjoyed it, and it is like I mean, again, it's got me back in touch with um, you know, sort of a group who I hadn't talked to in a couple of years. So well, that's good. I mean, I I'm, definitely I'm, like I'm definitely pro it. among us. It's a good concept, I think, and I think it it's probably is a lot better if you play entirely with a group of friends. It's just, I think for me, the aggravation comes from playing with random people on Discord who, yeah, just, yeah, you, oh yeah, I wouldn't play it just, with randomers. You just kind of objectify them, and then it's easy to just get mad because their <laughs> their their existence in your mind is purely just to cooperate with you in that game. Um, you could be talking about Among Us or Twitter here. Yeah, <laughs> very similar. Yeah, they're trying to explain to people why you're right and them refusing to believe it. Just swap imposters for trolls, and then it's uh, yeah, the same thing. But what else other than like popular video games would you um, recommend? That's a tough one. Because obviously we did our Bond marathon, yeah, which was a very good way of getting through some very lean times. Films, games. Um... You've stumped me here. <laughs> this is the million dollar question. I don't know, would, with a good uh, to this, would like speed rich. dating work, or is that too... Could be. Uh, depends on the... <laughs> depends on the... Uh, I suppose the group. Because um, obviously like a... we, we were considering showing up to a, a dating event. <laughs> oh yeah, the... Recently. Um, was it lefty dating? <laughs> I think we I, fought better of it eventually. I like the catchphrase for that. What was it? Um, showing the wrong kind of red flags. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I did consider showing up, and they could have had like a big USSR flag in the background. <laughs> Too bad That's I didn't your credentials right there. Yeah. 
Uh, I think that could work. Quoting from the Little Red Book. I haven't actually ventured into like um, Zoom dating, to be honest. Neither uh, have I. I. I think it could be fun though. Um, again, it depends on the group we're talking about here because this wasn't this like a young people's group. Yeah, depends how young. It could be a bit inappropriate, but yeah, sure. Could be fun. Uh, a bit of speed dating. You can do some like trivia or something. So, yeah, I'm really bad at answering this because I I absolutely haven't been keeping social during lockdown. <laughs> I've really just kept to myself, had my head down. Yeah, like you, I've been writing. Well, I am writing now, um, and just being a workaholic time to time. Well, speaking of writing, a writing group as well. I've joined one recently, and it's been oh, very have. good for like meeting other writers and having like a proper engaging discussion about what makes each other's writing good and where it can be improved. Like, it's very. I think you learn a lot about writing by actually criticizing other people's. Mm. Because then you can kind of get out of your own head a bit with it and just see what works and what doesn't. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, you, you've been doing that for me, luckily. Yeah. You've been mentoring me. Which is kind of why I'm thinking maybe I should just become like a creative writing teacher, if that's even a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would uh, definitely give you a good reference. Yeah. But that's you know that's a, that's my problems, not this person's problems. <laughs> We're not allowed to talk about our own problems outside of the uh, allotted hours. <laughs> I feel like there's always this air of um, similarity to like Alcoholics Anonymous or something with these kind of like online meetup groups. Yeah. During the pandemic, because I, I I haven't had too much exposure, but I I went to a couple like at the start with my then girlfriend and her friends and it did feel a bit like just people getting things off their chest being like oh, i'm so alone you know it it does sort of bring in the sort of people struggling with the pandemic yeah no, oh, again, especially at the start that, it was but... crazy like yeah nobody knew what was going to happen i mean people still don't really know what is going to happen but at least we're kind of used to it now pandemic's anonymous but yeah i mean obviously all the shit that's happened in wrestling and British wrestling in the past year for people listening who know me from uh, my Brit Rest podcast uh, back in the day. Um, you know, I have sort of joined like a lapsed fan community of like people I used to go to the shows with and that's been very good for getting through lockdown and actually meeting new people who I'd never met before as well um, and sort of sharing our other passions like motorsport and you know football manager and stuff like that that's been very good so again it can be a good way of getting back into contact with people or like forging a stronger bond with people i don't know i guess that is a good thing to emerge from a horrible situation is yeah. uh that people are more open to like hanging out in a group that they wouldn't usually yeah. Whereas before it might have been, oh yeah, we hang out once a month, but other than that, we can't really see each other. It's a bit hard to please people, I think, when you have such a general group as just young people. Yeah, I think that is a problem. Because yeah. I, I definitely found myself more attracted to these kinds of groups now, which are focused around a specific interest. Because I, I feel like that's just where you make the strongest bonds and you're going to have a or more stimulating time because it's something everybody wants to engage in i definitely considered doing um online art classes still might do if i find the time um because i was a an art when i was doing mm -hmm. a gcse nice um so yeah something like that um yeah i can't really give it much good advice i feel about this one sorry this is like the first one i feel a bit of a failure about <laughs> yeah yeah i do i do understand like um just sort of starting a general group out of nowhere might be difficult young people um but yeah i mean if you don't really have a choice if you never had like a chance to join a group pre-lockdown like... yeah and may i think if you're young as all well, you might not have any kind of specific interests at that yeah. point like i'm lucky that I, ha I went to shows for years and like met lots of people over that and like sort mm. of had that pre-baked bond to take into COVID with. Yeah. 
But yeah, if all else fails, Among Us yeah, well, <laughs> is my solution. Games, everybody likes films and games, and it's something yeah, you can kind you of Yeah, you can't retake. go wrong. There's loads of like free to play games. Well, I mean, Among Us isn't free to play, but it's very cheap. Like, um... uh, I pl- I think it's free on mobile. I've got the mobile. Oh, version. okay. Yeah. Well, it's very. It's like very. It's like I mean, like three pounds or something on Steam as well. Um, Rocket League is free to play, but you can get addicted to it, so be careful. <laughs> Um, I've been playing the nah, Battle Royale, Call of Duty Mobile. It's uh, surprisingly good, actually. It, it's very um, a lot like the console equivalent. Yeah, but um, somehow better than the current iterations of Warzone and things like that. Because I feel like those are just very cluttered and bloated with yeah dlc and any feature that was popular in any other good selling game is in that game yeah like there's too much going crafting on. battle royale <laughs> like, it, it sort of strips everything back and makes it a bit more straightforward like yeah so it's a bit like the call of duties of years past so, so there is definitely nice. options if you're feeling lonely and need a group but yeah it is difficult it's tough uh, times. Shall we move on? Let's move on. Okay, so this one, this is quite a strange one. It's a, a bit darker. Yeah. It's titled, My BF came to my hometown in secret and was living slash sleeping with my mum. This happened a few days ago. I was on exam season of my university and couldn't have much distractions because I had to study a lot. My boyfriend decided to come to my hometown. We are in a long distance relationship without telling me anything, and talked only with my mum to stay the days at her place. Me and my mum were not connected in this time because she had a huge fight with my dad and decided to move out. He knew my mum and dad had a big argument and things were not good, and he still came. He stayed at her place, eating, sleeping, and even going to work with her, and the worst happened when he had his own room, quote-unquote, to sleep, and decided in the middle of the night to move to my mum's room and asked her if he could sleep with her, there, near her. He even felt comfortable enough to ask my mum if he could sleep in his underwear, because it was too hot there. I'm completely in shock with this situation. I found out about this because my mum told me she felt bothered and uncomfortable with his presence and his behaviour. I confronted him, and he told me he came here without telling me because he didn't want to bother me. He He thinks this is normal and doesn't think he did nothing bad am i exaggerating thinking this was completely abusive and disrespectful i mean first of all i hope this isn't an english exam because mm. that was uh, some sloppy grammar there <laughs> um just kidding just kidding but yeah, that's a that's quite a worrying scenario to find yourself in your boyfriend with uh either very little boundaries or sinister intentions mm. and also a very passive mother or should i say mom yeah, that seems like mom. a plot of like yeah. a a book a prize book doesn't it like <laughs> <laughs> sort of someone trying to dismantle your family from the inside yeah mm. well i think there needs to be some investigation into why he was so pushy about that. It sounds like he's being pushy because the mum said she was uncomfortable with it, although didn't seemingly object. Um, but I, I don't know. My creep alarm's going off here. <laughs> he sounds like a bit yeah, of a. I mean, a bit of a Dave. It, yeah, anyone engaging in this kind of behaviour is not a savoury individual. Yeah. Can I... he be a? Can he be savoury? You can be unsavoury, but can you be savoury? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, one implies the other, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't. If if you're comfortable sleeping in your underwear next to your girlfriend's mum, that I mean that's very unusual behaviour. Unless you came from some absolute depraved household, I fear feel. Um, yeah, that's proper like urchin the, territory. Yeah, then this isn't normal, is it? And he's pushing his way into something else. He wants to have it on with. Yeah, but what can mommy. be done about this individual? Uh, Waterboard him. That's a little extreme. Uh, <laughs> and maybe if you're George W. Bush, but um, I would. There's nothing, no action you can really take other than break up with him and tell him to 
Take yeah, a like, really, buster. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's very concerning. But also, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed at the mum as well, because she's very passive in all of this. Like, after the fact, saying, oh, I was very uncomfortable with your boyfriend sleeping in my bed in his underwear. Yeah, surely you have the power to just kick him out. You'd think. Uh, I mean, you should. I mean, if you if you feel uncomfortable, you should be able to say, hey, this is not cool. Yeah, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> I, but again, we're missing some information. I here. kind of feel like maybe they're, they're going at it and they're not quite telling the full story. Yeah, <laughs> they're I just think like pulling so. the wool over her eyes a bit. And just be like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, just... I was very uncomfortable with it. Yeah, did, yeah. Didn't we hear a like a similar story in university about somebody um, sleeping with somebody else and being like, oh, it was just, it was just hot. That's why I'm not wearing, not wearing many <laughs> clothes. Oh yeah, no, I think so. I think um, not naming names. Karate Kid, right? Karate Kid. Yeah, maybe. I think he was the one who tried to claim that he was just hot. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's quite a um you have to have some gall to be able to pull that one off. Just two friends sharing a bed, not wearing many. Well, I guess yeah, if you hot. get caught in bed with a girl by her boyfriend, that's sort of the only thing you can say, right? <laughs> like what is how do you get out of that without just well, I mean, I guess you just take your punch in the face like a man, to be honest. Like, you just uh, yeah. say, alright, you got me. Don't be a weasel hit about it. Hit, hit me hard, that'll <laughs> you, you're the one make that, us even. You're the wrong one, so should be... Or you flip it on the girl and act completely surprised. You're like, you have a boyfriend? My god, yeah. you lied to me. And then you take the boyfriend's side. But that that's, um, that's double the weaseliness. Yeah, I mean, depending on where you're sitting, standing, lying down, you could just like make a go, make a play for the window and jump out of the window. Or pick that. up your clothes later. Yeah, um, never see or hear from again. No, I think you're right though. You should just, you know, admit it, or maybe just not sleep with other people's girlfriends, boyfriends to be with. Don't be a Dave. Nah, be a Dave. Um, you only got one life if <laughs> if yeah. they're up for it. <laughs> I mean, I've definitely been a Dave before. Um, Same, but is it a, is it a good thing? I've been I've been a Dave knowingly and unknowingly. I've definitely justified it to myself, thinking, "Oh, if it's not me, it'll be someone else." You know, it's just it, it's in the girl's yeah, character. Yeah, that is typically the situation. Behavior. Yeah, they're trying to get one back on yeah on their significant other. Or, you know, that you know, they're trying to resolve something within themselves. You are just the vessel through which they're doing that. Yeah. yeah. If it wasn't you, it'd be some other prick, so why not? Probably. <laughs> why not take advantage? Yeah. No, probably. Um <laughs> That's a... Uh... Yeah, take take advantage is the wrong phrase. I mean, um Yeah, don't don't take advantage. Earn your rewards. Cash in your club card. You know, you've got your ten stamps. You're entitled to your free latte. Should you not give the girl a good, or the guy a good talking to about why it's wrong to cheat on your significant other? <laughs> you can do that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think I can become the kind of person that can just pass over opportunities like that in in the name of morality. But um, mm, that's well, for your thirties, though. I, well, in a way, I think you're right, because I think you're just so full of hormones and insecurity, like, you're just going to pounce on the opportunity to have sex, because it's, you know, one for the score sheet, isn't it, and one for the, yeah. a boost for the ego, so it's, naturally, you do jump on the opportunity, even if it is at someone's detriment, but we're all works in progress, I think. We're going to, we can do better. I agree. Oh, I guess we agree that we just we need to kick this guy out. He's to sort his life out, get some healthy boundaries, at least. Yeah, he's 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 gonna do some mad shit coming up. So best get him, get rid of him. Yeah, maybe get rid of mum too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, mum is not covering herself in glory in this. As the Among Us players say, uh, "Big sus." 
Yeah, very sus. I think your mother's an imposter. Yeah. Uh, you got any more questions? I have more questions. This one's probably this one's the uh, hardest hitting of my three questions Oof. this evening. I don't know what my true personality is. What's wrong with me? I've always watched te- watched and mimicked people I'm around and people on TV. Emotions, mannerisms, laughs, walks. So I don't know my true personality other than this deep-seated anger from being bullied. I'm 26 now and still watch and observe people based on my surroundings and how they're acting. What do I do? How do I find me? And me is in bold. Oh, it's it's interesting you bring this one up because I empathize a lot with this question. Um, <laughs> I know I through only until like the last couple of years I really struggled with my self identity. Um, yeah, it's been a, a big thing for me. There's no real sort of nice advice I don't think to getting out of that behavior of sort of doubting yourself because um. You just you've got to go through shit. I think to build your character, and then know what you like, what you dislike, and then know how you behave to things. Because I think if you're if you're young and insecure, you do naturally just gravitate towards other people with stronger personalities, and you take on board what they do, what they say, and try to sort of emulate that, thinking it's you know it's a good example. And honestly, it's not always the case. You know, I've, I've definitely yeah. gravitated towards some absolute horrendous people <laughs> uh, <laughs> growing up just because they have like a big personality, you know. Yeah. Um, but especially in that age of like you know sixteen to twenty one, yeah. like there's people developing at different rates, and you know there's obviously there's always boisterous people. There's always people, you know, with very loud opinions and not afraid to voice them. And those are the people who people naturally gravitate towards. And yeah, it is quite bad. Like, <laughs> if you fall under the thrall of one of these uh, sort of Boris types, um, you yeah. know, too much ego for their own good, um, a bit too, you know, um, a bit too driven, you know. <laughs> yeah, they'll... It's good to have drive, but then there's also a limit before you just turn into a prick. <laughs> no, for sure. Like, those kind of people can push the those who are unsure about themselves around quite easily because yeah. you know, it, yeah. it's the yin and yang the two kind of attract each other I think um, but I, and yeah, I think it, it takes a while like you know it takes a long time to truly find yourself and it, again you never truly do I guess until you reach some sort of spiritual nirvana later in life um, yeah. you know it's a constant you know, chemical mix. You're constantly pouring different things into the test tube. Yeah. Sometimes it explodes in your face. <laughs> um, no, sure. But yeah, I think developing the confidence to sort of stand on your own two feet and be like, I'm happy with who I am. I don't need a Boris type telling me that I'm great or I'm terrible. Or, you know, I don't need to put my life in their hands. I think that does take a while, but it is a beautiful thing to be able to achieve. Yeah, um, no, quite right. Um, I'm just trying to think back to my my own example because I think everyone has self identity. Um, no one's inherently a blank slate. I think yeah. In my case, at least, I think my um, insecurity in that regard came from just being made to feel kind of ashamed of who I am, hiding behind those other big personalities. Then to um, sort of boost myself up, as it were. Um, just being a bit of a puppy, really. And I think it's only once people start poking holes in that, um, that you do actually grow as a person. Um, because I, I can think the last few years I put myself in some quite extreme situations where people have definitely sort of poked and prodded at my, um, my being, and yeah, it's only once that's happened that you get pushed enough you learn to actually stand up for yourself and i think mm-hmm. once you do you realize oh it works you know you can actually stand up for yourself and you you love yourself a bit more once you get that kind of positive feedback 
of being able to push back and uh yeah i think i think honestly that's that's the quickest easiest way to get com- sort of confidence about yourself and actually it's not quick and easy but it's the quickest and easiest way there is i think uh it just comes with age and experience really uh keep an open mind to try new things don't hide away from new opportunities let yourself be challenged yeah i think that's uh about all i can say um <laughs> it's a, a sort of summary of my own experiences and uh probably the yeah. important and obviously uh this person in particular has sort of had a bad time from being bullied growing up and obviously that's a really you know an awful thing that a lot of people have to go through um and it does fuck you up for like you know for your adolescence and for your your 20s and beyond yeah. in like being able to speak up like again as i say the boris types for and through like yeah. he was in the bullingdon club he was the keeper of the eating wall like <laughs> this guy's through and through like a you know boisterous bully sort of guy like <laughs> Yeah, he's never he's had the person who you know crushes other people's confidence underneath his own. Just you know, it's like dog eat dog, isn't it? And yeah. you know, it shouldn't it shouldn't have to be like that, but unfortunately, it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely um, it's about rejecting that system, I guess. Yeah, I think taking hits when you're younger can it can it can take take its toll because you're very easily influenced when you're younger, like early yeah. years of your teens as well um no it, i mean shaped. back when i was in in uh secondary school when i I left it for a year like that was entirely why because i kept on getting bullied by like prefect types and even like some of the like teachers who were like fresh out of oxbridge and like wanted to be like rah rah best friends with the kids and like make like you know banter with them and like these people are <laughs> they're not afraid to just absolutely crush you <laughs> to just make themselves feel good for a second Jeez. and it's awful it's a bad situation yeah. and again i'm very glad that i left that school went to a different one uh that was a lot more you know tolerant and accepting and managed to build my way up from there doesn't that say a lot about the teachers though how how shitty and insecure they are to have to pick on like one yeah. of their students just to boost themselves up in the eyes of like their students um you'd have like so little um authority and uh stature yeah that you well, it was to, like a culture yeah. thing like sort of you know a bunch of as i say sort of like i don't know, I don't know exactly what age you was but sort of like fre- as i say sort of fresh r- wet behind the ears sort of lads 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 sort of thing and like posh boy as well like posh boy i don't lads. know just all of that is a, a <laughs> as i say you sort of mix your personality like a chemistry set and sometimes it just blows up in your face and i think yeah that's a, a potent mix of um badness for should, lack of a better word should have knocked him out yeah well again i was only like 13 or 12 so <laughs> <laughs> i probably couldn't <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, same kind of, I mean, I never had grief with my teachers, but I definitely was made to feel like a, an odd one out when I showed up at secondary school in England for the first time. You know, I was like the, the sort of scummy Welsh yeah. kid in most people's eyes that, you know, like, oh, it's funny, isn't it, uh, being Welsh? You know, I, was, I feel like I was the sort of comedy character walking around in uh, someone else's film, almost. Yeah, sort of, oh no, it's terrible. Uh, a good start to... Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> being. But yeah, I think we've both um, we've both done a good job in the last couple of years of sort of being able to find our personalities a bit more and sort mm. of uh, develop a unique worldview that isn't just informed by what other people want and you know trying to impress other people. For sure, and I think there's a great value to that. I think, uh, well, like I I just said, you know those hard knocks you take actually shape you into someone better and stronger ideally as long yeah. as you deal with them because i think they can they can drag you down you can end up yeah. quite bitter uh as <laughs> well an adult. they've certainly done that to me <laughs> but i mean but, it, yeah it's a, again it's you, about you do, overcoming them 
you know, yeah, it takes a while to like learn from them and be able to to grow past them. Yeah, because um, I well, I like to think now if I if I ever saw any of the people that gave me shit at school for whatever reason, yeah, well, they would probably run in the other direction now. Um, well, maybe not run, but you know, I, I feel like the tables would be turned quite drastically. <laughs> um, but I suppose that that's a one strategy, isn't it? It's, it's either you turn the table or you just walk away from the table, and I think you know either yeah. are quite acceptable. Yeah, fight or flight. I guess you're more turn over the table, and I'm more walk away from the table. <laughs> well, fair enough, though. I mean, you, I you definitely argue I've, I've wasted too much time, like thinking uh about these things and trying to develop myself yeah. uh in motivation of those yeah and it's also good to spot like when people are trying to manipulate you in an unhealthy way and be able to say fuck off i'm doing my own thing and like yeah. not fall under their thrall like obviously you know there's a lot of abusive relationships both romantic and not in the world and i feel like that is kind of part of it is just like a very like dominant personality like boisterous and authoritative taking advantage of you know someone a bit more meek and still like figuring themselves out Mm. and yeah it's a scary thing to do to be able to walk away from you know someone that you know you kind of idolize and look up to but it is kind of again it's part of growing up and i say growing up like a you know across your whole yeah. life through to like your 60s and 70s like uh yeah like learning exactly what it is that you are i mean that's the existential questions isn't it who am i what is my relationship to others like if you can figure those out you will hit that sort of spiritual nirvana that sort of you know cosmic world view where just i i guess it will fit like when I eventually do answer those existential questions. It will feel like the the bit in the Matrix where uh, Neo becomes the one, and just everything just becomes so simple, and you're just flicking away punches with, <laughs> you know, not with no effort whatsoever. Like that's what it feels. That's like. That's probably what it will feel like. I mean, I can say these days that it feels a bit more like that. I, I've definitely got a thicker skin for it all. But yeah, I think. Uh... You're going to be okay in to sum up everything for this person. Mm. Uh, this is a topic I feel like I could just talk about endlessly. It's sort of <laughs> been the defining yeah. um, sort of topic of my last 10 years of my life, I think. Um, or maybe more. But yeah, I think you know, it will get better I mean, just as you get older naturally because you, you, know, you, you have to live life, don't you? And, uh, You'll figure it out. Just uh, don't. I think don't carry around your bitterness. It's good to let go of that one way or another. Whether it's beating it or letting go of it completely. Lovely. Lovely. Hit me with a hit me with your rhythm stick. <laughs> Fuck's sake. <laughs> hit me with a problem. All right. It's my last one. Uh. It's a bit wordy, but um, I did my best. I quit my job after a big boss left a big dump in our only bathroom intentionally. I didn't seem to mind the wrong person found it. Increasingly inappropriate behavior becoming acceptable, so I quit with capitals. I worked at a local donut shop for nearly eight years as a supervisor slash assistant, working my way up from hourly staff. I took pride in knowing the brand standards and running a tight ship. I was friendly with my staff. We all would consider each other friends outside of work, but with limits. We've always shuffled managers, but the last one assigned to the store September last year takes the cake. As uh, He's a mid-30s tall, overweight fella with what he claims to be eight kids at home. You'd think he'd mature some with that responsibility, but this guy is the most immature human being I've ever met. He makes fart jokes constantly several times an hour. He talks with a friend of his he hired after cutting the veteran staff's hours to accompany her to the schedule about previous jobs where people had sex in the mop closet. It was an almost daily thing for one of them to mention it. 
Then, give his manager also a new and part of a package deal with his management shakeup. He sees the behavior firsthand, and a few of us employees who didn't care for it too much all kind of raised a brow for his response. And to our surprise, he laughed out loud, and we were immediately drained. It became harder and harder to get someone to take a complaint seriously. We just became an annoyance after all our hard work and dedication because we were now strangers to these people. Come a week or so later, my manager and his regional manager were in the store and one of them bought with them a can of fart spray and sprayed it in a common area and it smelled bad. It was strong because the store's lobby is only 30 by 10. Um... I don't know what that measurement's in. I have to mention the lobby was closed due to COVID-19 protocol in our county. The staff, however, was still present, and only two out of five thought it was funny. A few minutes go by. I like the uh, survey there. Yeah. A few minutes go by, and a 30-something <laughs> female employee goes into the restroom to relieve herself, and the single toilet unisex restroom toilets was full of poop, and the air was thick from fart spray and actual fart slash poop. Uh, she had to use the toilet, so she in turn had to clean this mess first, use the toilet, and then go gripe. When she went out, they were laughing openly, and she became ashamed and embarrassed, and chose for her job security sake she wouldn't complain in fear of retaliation. A day or so later, when I found out just how upset it made her, and why she was in fear of speaking up, I became infuriated. We have had an unexplained loss in income, but expected to work harder while we were there because there are less employees, all while being forced to accept the immature, inappropriate fart, poop, sex jokes, or fear losing more hours or losing days and hours and not being able to feed your family because you stand up to what you're starting to believe strongly in and it's not right, so I quit. I just need someone to tell me I'm not crazy, I'm having a hard time finding employment after quitting, and my stress and anxiety is eating me up inside. I have a wife whose income easily sustains us, but it hurts me deeply to rely on her as I've never had to. I'm the provider and I support her and our two children, which as of right this moment, I'm not, and it's very hard mentally. I'm trying so hard and I'm beating myself up simultaneously. What to do, what to do. Yeah, that one, that went on a bit, sorry. (laughs) Uh, um, But I think to sum up, um, they've got a new boss who is very immature, likes to make sex, fart jokes, etc. Yeah. And left a huge dump in the staff toilet for someone to clean up. And I mean, I was going to say, first of all, donut shop. That's like the dream shop. Dream, dream job, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> it's not my dream job. <laughs> Well, I mean, if it's if it's like um like an artisan donut shop, not like Dunkin' Donuts or something, but um maybe I think they did mention it was a franchise, so I'm, oh, think, okay. I'm, I'm thinking well, Dunkin' not. Donuts. Yeah, well, I was thinking more like uh you know like those Welsh cake shops you get in Cardiff, but <laughs> oh, don't know. I haven't even been to Cardiff um, once actually. But yeah, retail bosses are like literally scum of the earth. I think they they are literally. I can't think of a worse. Maybe you know, other than like really, really, really bad criminals. Yeah, you, retail bosses are the lowest of the low. I feel like yeah, it, it's a thin line, isn't it, between being a retail boss, um, and a criminal. You're just like one <laughs> step away. I mean, yeah, yeah, syn- synonyms, right? Yeah. I imagine a lot of retail bosses also veer into the world of crime. I'm thinking of one of my previous employers in particular. Um, yeah, I do. I do know uh, places that have like stolen out of uh, the cash registers and stuff. Ooh, yeah, happen- yeah. yeah, it definitely happens quite a bit. But yeah, more just like you know, the sort of person who becomes a retail boss. It's kind of like. You know, they've seen Gordon Ramsay on TV and decided, I want to be that. Yes. No, 100%. Like, I I feel like being a retail manager, I'm sure there's good retail managers, you know, people. Yeah, actually... I'm, not, yeah I'm not trying to tar them all with the yeah. same brush, but. <laughs> I'm just saying for the sake of, um, 
think and as I say, it. especially like um like independent places. Obviously, the managers there are solid gold, but like a, you know what I mean, like a chain franchise manager. Yeah, no, and usually they are bottom of the barrel because I mean working in retail is usually nobody's dream. Um, and to become yeah. manager, you well, have to stick not at for it, right? like a chain, as I say. Yeah. Like it would be, it might be different for an independent place, but there's so few, especially after COVID. Independent places are so like down and out now, and obviously all the big boys are moving in, moving in for the kill. It's very depressing. Yeah. So you've got to be a particular kind of person to stick at it long enough to become a manager. Um, yeah. Maybe it's because you're not good at anything else, and it's just. Uh... Well, I mean, as I, I for like supervisors and like um like assistant managers, I'm gold with them because they're usually the people who have worked up from part time mm. or like from the lowest level, and they're usually like normal people. But the managers are people who have gone on like specific management courses and have nothing else in their life other than management if you are a retail manager please feel free to tell me to fuck off <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well i see what you mean like they've kind of doubled down on this career yeah That's they've not specifically they chosen it as the career path and they may not necessarily have as much experience as the staff below them uh, uh see i was seeing it kind of differently because i i remember my sort of managers all kind of flexing on the fact they'd worked at the same bar for like 12 years or something yeah. and that's like a really I mean that's even worse bar. isn't it like <laughs> yeah. this is my bar yeah um because that means you get like massively territorial about it oh yeah exactly don't put it into perspective but no i i see i understand i i understand what you mean as well about the types of people who've just gone on like some kind of course and they've just jumped straight into a managerial managerial role without the sort of um experience on the sort of lower tier as it were but even if they have experience it's more like the mindset of like i'm going to be the manager <laughs> yeah this is this is my Top of the food chain it's like it's the same sort of uh thing that created the handforth parish council it's like trying to grab measly <laughs> power and wield it over everyone and everyone yeah that you can get your hands on it's yeah, you have these desperate attempts at power grabs, I feel, um, in retail jobs, because yeah, it's just petty, isn't it? Because maybe they've got, it's all they've got, and they desperately feel like they need to cling on to it, just to have something. That's what I imagine, mm. anyway. Um, cause and I, I respect everyone who isn't a manager in retail, but it's the managers that, yeah. Is it? <laughs> I have no respect for the managers. <laughs> usually, they want to inflate their ego to make themselves feel important, whereas it's just a yeah. retail job. Like nobody cares that you're the manager of I don't know Dunkin' Donuts or wherever. You know, um, it's so insignificant these days, especially because you know franchises they're just ten a penny. And yeah, I guess I guess it's that like. Every everyone else is a normal person, you know, mm. doing what they do. But yeah. the managers are like taking pride in their mm. managerial position, and <laughs> yeah, um, I can't. And also think... like bo bossing around like teenagers and like lording it over them. Like <laughs> I've definitely had decent assistant managers, but I can't. Yeah, as think I say, assistant managers manager are usually I've really brilliant. liked. Not as a manager, anyway. Like they've always been dickheads. Um, in my experience, the the day when the manager isn't in, but the assistant manager is, that's the good day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, moving back to this guy's question, I think it was a guy. Um, yeah. Sounds like a absolute nightmare of a manager here. I mean, not even one that's well. Clearly, they've got. A big ego. They don't seem to think that they can be challenged by anyone, as we've kind of established. But yeah, I mean, this this is going above and beyond. This is yeah, like proper David power. Brent style management. Like, oh, I'm just one of the, <laughs> exactly, one of yeah. the lads. I'm having a great time, shoving his jokes down their throat, whether they like it or not. Yeah, and no one can like, say otherwise. Again, he's just he doesn't have enough time to just go and be a stand up comedian because 
Well, he's too busy managing. <laughs> or he's, he's too busy watching like CCTV tapes at two a.m., like checking to make sure that you've given out the right change that day. That, or you know, maybe fart jokes have kind of outlived the. Um, yeah, well, I mean, if he ever did get on world. stage, he'd just get absolutely silenced to death. Like he would get no reaction whatsoever because he's, he has no, no comedic bone in his body. Is worrying how accurate. The character of David Brent is like the older I get, the more I just realize <laughs> you know, it, it's it's really there's yeah. so much truth to it. Um, luckily, in the corporate world, I've actually come up with um, actually, I would, I would kind of exclude my current job from my comments about managers in the corporate world. It's been, <laughs> it's been pretty good. I mean, we were talking about retail managers specifically, anyway, but <laughs> please don't fire me. <laughs> uh, not even for that, but like just to say, like, it, it seems a lot better in the corporate world. Um, yeah, because we were just no, talking about it's... David Brent. I mean, um, but like in the retail world, at least I get it seems like everybody's a David Brent, and they're just trying to be, trying to be liked, trying to be, trying to hold on to their authority at the same time. And just it's an yeah, it's that weird task. mix yeah. of like trying to be everyone's mate, but also ordering everyone around to a far more significant degree than they ever need to. Yeah. It is it's bizarre. Like <laughs> I just can't get into their mindset. Like how how can you live with yourself if you act like that? If you just like relentlessly boss people around but then also try and be best mates with them. Yeah. Or like when they like say, Oh, I've I've bought in some roses or quality street, therefore I'm a good person <laughs> and I can just say whatever I want to. Mm. And then if you ever say anything back, but I bought in the roses. <laughs> I'm a good boss. <laughs> Actually I can think of one good retail manager I had. I'm not gonna name names, but I just yeah. wanted to correct myself there. Um Yeah, but in terms of this this boss, it, I think quitting is the right move because it's it's a uphill battle. I think to try and yeah, you can maybe log log a complaint with a franchise at least, but I, in my own experience, yeah, it's a bit of a dead end. Anywhere. Yeah, head office and yeah, really as exists, the finance, front. he doesn't seem he doesn't have any. I mean, again, you just have to swallow your pride in this situation. Like you're not, you don't have any financial problems because your wife is bringing home the bacon you just gotta take that for a few months and see where you can find employment elsewhere mm. again like as as good as working in a independent donut shop would have been even if this wasn't an independent one um you know it's not something you want to do forever so it's probably a good thing to leave and you can probably find something better to be honest yeah maybe you can use that time off work for good that's assuming Retail isn't his a uh, long term job of choice because there's also nothing wrong with that. Like, I think it's easy to talk down about these kinds of jobs, as in, because I mean, in my experience, these are just jo jobs I've just done to get by, you know, or just to have the mm. experience. But there's also nothing wrong with them being your long term job. And it, yeah, well, should... I mean, if you can, if you find a role where you're not like stressed out, you get good hours, yeah. and you're treated like a human being. And you have a good boss and like good support staff, like yeah, that's fantastic. That's all you ever want. I I do really hate this sort of idea that oh yes, you must get a proper career and you know do something meaningful. It's like nobody has to do anything meaningful if they don't want to. Yeah. What is meaning? Like you know we're we are all going to die alone and we're all going to turn into dust eventually. So like why not make your life as happy as possible? But I think the sure. reason why I'm so down on retail is that my experience of it has been unilaterally, you know, awful manager, you know, dingy, dingy shop, incredibly busy, no windows, like, you know, it's, it's you know, <laughs> if I could find a place where it was like a lot more supportive and you have a good, good relationship with your boss and you're doing something that you enjoy doing, then yeah, I, I would love to while away my life in a retail job. If it was, you know, good for me. But yeah, obviously, a lot of them aren't good for you. <laughs> unless you are yeah. a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely there's definitely plenty of retail jobs that are actually really good. I'm sure, yeah. 
I mean, I picture like a retail job in a small town or something as being the ideal because at least then you have familiarity with your customer base. I think the problem yeah. comes now, you know, retail has lost its soul in a way, especially in big cities, you know, where you just get an influx of faces. Yeah, and... like the gi- the giant Amazon Mart. Yeah, and... I, I couldn't keep like a, a happy face on. Yeah. No, the the people who work in like the Amazon warehouses, they're like gods among men to be able to put up with that shit. Like <laughs> Absolutely. And um it's sad to think, you know, like they're treated the way they are when you know, it's an, it's it's a job someone needs to do and I think people are being pushed out of those jobs. It's a bit sort self fulfilling really. Like I think it's a job people don't necessarily want to do long term. Therefore it's made into a job that treats people poorly expecting yeah, them not they, to de- they deliberately abuse people because they know that they're not going to be around for very long yeah and then it just which is pretty disgusting to be honest just becomes this horrible cycle and makes it a nightmare really for the most part <laughs> um, and then they have the goal to call them fulfillment centers <laughs> i love that that's so dystopian <laughs> oh the amazon warehouses <laughs> yeah they're called fulfillment centers wow well, fulfilling That's your like order, proper, not your dreams. Yeah, re- reprogramming allotment. <laughs> Jesus. But, yeah. Um... But yeah, I think if you've worked for that long in, like, a chain place, you could probably find, like, a much more desirable role in, like, an independent shop if they still exist <laughs> after the if pandemic. If they still exist. Quite right. Um... So, yeah. Get googling like independent donut shops and see if you can't wangle your way in. That would be nice, yeah. Uh, although I, I've had experience with independent. Well, I keep saying retail. My I've never had any real retail experience. Just hospitality, but I think they're one of the same. I yeah, think. I've had my. No, I know. I know it can produce its own sort of yeah, horrors, it, but it in go... general, it's more desirable than a chain. Uh, I think you, usually yeah, you'll have more luck at least at least it's um the situation's more manageable in terms of you know you you know what you're dealing with rather than this big corporate entity hovering above you that can act yeah. in mysterious and ways. your manager's more likely to be a normal person and not like a uh, I don't know manager course produced well insane person a real person maybe but that can that can go one of two ways because I can <laughs> think of independent businesses I've worked for where yeah, you, you you may not ever be able to turn your phone off. Yeah, like they could just be you're dialing just, you up twenty four seven. Yeah, or or you're just working for someone's like uh, wet dream of a business, which isn't really <laughs> realistic. Yeah, so obviously it comes with its own pros and cons, but mm. yeah, this this guy will land on his feet. He's not he's not got money to worry about. The job he has quit is not like. You know, it's not the be all end all. It's not like he has to start from the beginning again. No, he'll be all right. Don't worry. Yeah, I think so. But uh, I wish there was more we could do in terms of getting these people out of power. <laughs> Maybe we should start our own uh, job site. <laughs> <laughs> Take it to Indeed and Monster. A job site for independent businesses. It's not a ah. terrible idea. We're just having uh, business meetings on air now. <laughs> but taking a shit in a toilet and letting someone find it is, you know, that's the humor. Yeah, of like that a, goes above and beyond. This kind like needs a five to fucking. He needs to get fired. He needs to get reprimanded. Yeah. He needs to get sent down to the basement of head office to do, uh, you know, wipe the toilets there forever. Pretty much, and that's a that's a suitable use of the c word there. <laughs> Well done. Thank you. Drop the C bomb. Remember, that's the that's the better C word than the other one on this podcast. I'd much rather hear that C word than the oh. other one. Yeah, cunt creator. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what? Should we, we do? Should we do our final problem, or have we overrun uh, already? No, let's do our final problem. I mean, all right. Let's call it an extra. Well, we said episode. obviously we're we're recording this on Valentine's Day. Obviously, when you're listening to this, it'll it'll be long past the need for any sort of love in the world. But here's a little bit of it for you future people. Aww. How do I create a romantic Valentine's Day with my wife while quarantining with our six-year-old daughter? We've been quarantining for ages now. Cannot get a sitter. 
cannot leave the house. Our daughter is very attached to her mum, my wife, because we've been quarantining so much. Our marriage has really been suffering because neither of us are taking care of ourselves emotionally through this quarantine experience. We will be celebrating Valentine's Day on Monday, because Sunday is the last day of term for the online graduate courses. My wife is also adamant that I make this Valentine's Day about her and not about our daughter. I need a lot of advice here. She's adamant because she's exhausted by her online master's program, and she really wants to be taken care of. Okay, so... If I'm getting the gist of that question right, it's um, how to do something romantic at home with a six-year-old yeah. around. Basically. Okay. Um, that's an interesting one. I haven't really thought about it yet because I'm spending Valentine's Day alone this year. Self-love. Um, <laughs> well, I guess we are each other's Valentine's yes. Day dates. I'll be your Valentine's moment. Day. I'll be your Valentine. I, I choo choo choose you. Oh, yeah. Um, Let's be friends. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a picture of a bee on it. Um, what romantic things can you do at home? Don't know, you really got to think outside of the box for this one because it's been a very unromantic year, hasn't it? Especially if, yeah. you, if you've been to get like at home together all year. I can this has to be gonna... the driest year ever, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's under understandable how you might start to resent each other a bit at home. Um, like, because during the world wars, you had like all the cabaret clubs in Paris. You know, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the cabaret clubs. No. Um, ugh. I'm looking out onto my balcony here and thinking, you know, I could like dress up the table potentially if I was in that position. And have, like, a... mm. It's too cold to be outdoors though. If you have like a heater or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, you can cook your wife a dinner, um, you know, download some stupid rubbish on the iPad or on Netflix or whatever for your daughter to sit in front of. Get her a new video game, maybe. And then, yeah. Scatter the roses over the table. Get the... Get the... Uh, I don't know who's a romantic uh, music artist. Uh, I was going to say Michael Blunt. Bublé, but that's... Yeah, oh, James Plum, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Is he romantic? My triangle. <laughs> um... um. Yeah, keep the kid distracted first of all. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have many good tips for, like, wooing a woman. <laughs> I think, yeah, cooking for her is always a good shout. That can't ever go wrong. Beyond that, you know, take her to a cracking owl sanctuary, but you're in quarantine. I think just do all the trimmings, you know. You, don't, you can be forgiven for not doing anything super original this year. But you know, just I don't light some candles. Um, yeah, like, like candles say nice music. Dress the table, make a nice dinner. Um, I don't see nothing wrong with a little bump and grind. Um, yeah. Um, buy her a nice present, maybe if that's within your budget. Nice bracelet. If you can think of anything, I'm terrible at buying presents. Um. A uh, uh, World Cup '98 annual. <laughs> I'm sure she'd love that. I mean, if she's doing her Read masters about now. Bulgaria's run to fourth place. If she's in doing her masters now, what she like 22 probably. So she might not even have been born in '98. Six year old daughter. I don't think she'd be 22. <laughs> oh, I thought. No, I I was talking about the wife girlfriend. Yeah, she is the mother of the daughter. Oh. So unless she had the kid super early, <laughs> maybe I think 16. they're probably a bit older. If it's like yeah, like you can do a masters at any time. True, I'm being judgmental there. I I forgot about the daughter for a second there, but we've already distracted the daughter anyway, so don't worry about that. <laughs> She's out of the picture. She's on Netflix, yeah. ruining your search history. Obviously, buy some nice flowers. Um. Give her some attention. I think that's that's also the the most important yeah. part of it. Just uh, 
it's a day to be mindful of why you appreciate your significant other. So keep, yeah. bear in mind why you are with her and uh, communicate that to her, make her feel yeah. special. I think cooking a dinner and then just having a dinner between yourself and just yeah, have, like in, engaging in some sparky conversation, yeah. I think that'd be perfect. You know what else is Can't good? Go wrong with now that I think of it, photos. If you have a lot of photos together, a really good gift, I think, is to like print them out and make like a photo album or something like that, or like frame them. <laughs> I know it's, it's kind of corny, but I think it's nice to like. Visu- it help again helps to uh, remember like good things between you and why you're together. And yeah, uh, so do something like that, uh, something nice and sentimental. Um, go out for a nice walk. I don't know, COVID style. <laughs> go to your favorite spot if you got one. And just don't set the house on fire with the candles. No. That would make for a very bad Valentine's that Day. That would be bad, very bad. And yes, eventually, when the candles have burned down to a little nub, the dinner's been finished, you've put your daughter to bed, some wine has been consumed, the music has finished, <laughs> the light is low and languid, and your lover walks over to you in her dress and goes, take me to bed and you just do what a man does in the cold dark light of the moon. Make sure you drop her on the bed and body slam her like uh, a pro wrestler. (laughs) (laughs) And then the camera turns away to the open window where the curtains billow in the breeze an owl hoots And the circle of life continues. That's how it goes down. You do her. You, you do her up the bum. <laughs> I mean, if there's ever a time to do anal, it's uh, Valentine's <laughs> Day, right? Something special for everybody. Oh dear. And on that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeremy. I think, yeah, we've solved this guy's problem, I think. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? What about the um, forfeits we're going to perform? Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I've forgotten about it. <laughs> what a good podcast host I am. Um, Yeah, so, well, last year, actually not even last year, the year before, um, so I keep forgetting how long this shit's been going on for, um, our mutual friend bet me that I wouldn't do a bungee jump. Um, I think it was by the end of 2019 and alas I did not do it I I did say I didn't have money at the time because to do it here in London is quite expensive like it is yeah. it's nearing like the £100 mark uh, and to be you should have spotted you some of it <laughs> <laughs> well part, part of the bet was that if I did do it he'd pay for it for oh me. okay uh, yeah. but I just didn't have the money at the time and Okay, maybe part of me was leaning on that as an excuse not to do it because <laughs> I maybe I could have mustered up the money somehow. But um, yeah, I'm still determined to do it. And um, as a forfeit, maybe you can do that with me. Oh man, that'd be scary. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the point. Jesus. Um. Yeah, that's pretty good motivation, I would say. I was gonna, I was gonna self forfeit and say that I'd have to make, I'd have to call the main character Tom and turn him into like a massive like paragon of virtue, and he can do nothing wrong. If I didn't fulfill this first draft within a month, I feel like that's probably a good way of, like a, a self sabotage of my own book if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't finish it in time. So you'd call the main character of the novel Tom, and yeah, and he would do no wrong and just like be able to solve everything instantly. Hmm. Doesn't sound like a good book though. If he's well, exactly, just... so I gotta f- finish it. <laughs> Is that Tom after me? Yeah, I don't think I'm a paragon of virtue. <laughs> exactly, uh, flattered though. Well, I would I would be doing it as a, a a bad thing to ruin my book. Yeah. So, well, don't ruin it. I mean, sort of a micro compliment, if anything. <laughs> if you, 
as long as you ruin it on like a second copy of your craft, yeah. it's fine. And there might even be like a good mental exercise to kind of figuring out what yeah. works and what doesn't work. Bad literature. Yeah, because I mean, I feel like I've learned a lot from watching bad films with you. It's uh, <laughs> definitely helped me learn <laughs> like how not, not to tell to a story. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So could be a good exercise. Yeah. Just, yeah. Don't vandalize the original draft. I'll try not to, but I can't promise anything. Again, I just, all I've got to do to avoid this is just finish the first draft. So that's what I'll be doing. You got this.